but on a chosen uh, on a chosen uh, either real device or a simulator. So uh, now that we've um, imported these packages, we need to just basically define uh, the necessary um, parameters of these uh, registers as well as the circuit. And we can do that um, by first looking at just a very simple single qubit circuit. And I'm only going to focus on, on single qubits uh, purely because of, of time constraints and as well as it being just the most simple uh, quantum uh, co quantum computing uh, um, sort of Python notebook we can construct to basically give us this intro to Qiskit. So for quantum register, the parameter one tells us there's one qubit in our register. Uh, the classical register with parameter one just tells us we have one classical bit for which we're going to store our, info, our information of the outcome of measurement uh, from the qubit. The quantum circuit will accept as parameters the quantum register and the classical register and creates this quantum circuit object. So, you know, when, when once you have these notebooks, you can read through this information that I have here, which explains in, in a bit more detail uh, what each of these uh, functions do. So, the circuit that we want to simulate is just going to be a very simple uh, not case, right? It's so a simple not operation. So, as you would have learned with, with Professor Petruccione, uh, the qubit can exist in the state zero or one, but also in a superposition of these states. So we're just wanna, we just wanna do a circuit that effectively when the qubit is in the state, uh, the ket vector zero, it will negate it and make it the state one and vice versa. So this is a very, very simple circuit and it's also very, very important in, in classical computing as well. This is the quantum analog, of course. So we use the, the, this not operation X is just the Pauli X gate. It's the Pauli, uh, the Pauli matrix that's called Sigma X. Um, and effectively to construct the circuit, um, we just call it, we say QC dot X. And what this does is it adds the gate X to the quantum circuit and the parameter Q of zero just specifies to which qubit in your quantum register you need to apply this gate. So Q of zero means apply it to the uh, first qubit in your quantum register. But since there's only one, Keep it in that register. Q of zero is just the, it's, you know, uh, saying apply X to just the one qubit. We apply a barrier and this just separates the preparation and the measurement step in the quantum computer. It's not necessary, but it makes the circuits look very, very neat. Um, and it also aligns the idea that in quantum uh, mechanics, preparation and measurement are separate. We, unlike in classical physics where they're all uh, blurred together, we don't need to make this distinction. Then we say QC dot measure with the parameters Q and C. And what this does is it applies a measurement gate to the quantum register and it stores the information in the classical registers. So we can use the, the draw function, which we say QC dot draw to actually draw the circuit. And you've probably seen with Professor Petruccione what the, the quantum circuit drawn out looks like. And this is effectively it. Um, Q zero is telling us where it's one qubit in the register. We apply the X gate. We put the barrier, we measure, and we store the information in the classical register. So to run our quantum circuit, we usually need uh, something called a backend. And a backend is going to be the device where you will run the circuit. So if you choose a backend that is a real device through the IBM uh, quantum experience in the cloud, then you would, uh, you would need to specify that by having a token to register on the website, et cetera. But we're just gonna use simulators, meaning the circuit is going to be simulated by a classical computer. So we make use of something called the CASM simulator. Uh, CASM is for quantum assembly, and it's effectively, uh, it's a, the quantum assembly language, which provides a set of instructions that the quantum device will use uh, to actually run your circuit. And the CASM simulator just simulates this whole process. So uh, Qiskit gives you access to something called uh, AIR, which is the provider that gives you access to all of these simulators. Um, so all we're going to do is we're going to import air from Qiskit and we're going to define the backend to chasm simulator. So everything that we're going to do with the chasm simulator is effectively going to replicate how, we would, how it, this experiment would look if we ran it on the real device. And what does this mean? Well, on a real quantum computer, we prepare our initial, our qubit, um, say n number of times, right? We prepared n number of times and we apply our gates n times to each of the n uh, copies of the qubit, and we make the measurements n times and we do statistics. That's how we do experiments with a quantum computer. So the chasm simulator effectively replicates this. So 
what this means is that at the end, uh, when you specify n, and n usually, is usually referred to as the shots, and this is the number of times you repeat the experiment, um, effectively what will happen is you will get the outcome of your measurement. You would get n, you would get n uh, a, 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 a set of n elements where each element is going to be the outcome of the measurement of a qubit. And what do I mean by this? Well, a qubit can be, as I said, either in a state zero or one or in a superposition. And when we measure this qubit, we collapse the superposition and we either get the outcome zero or one. That's why we need to store this outcome into a classical bit. Um, when we repeat this experiment, say n times, let's say if we do it a thousand times, we might actually obtain, uh, if the qubit is in a superposition of the state, uh, half the time in zero and half the time in one, um, then effectively you should expect that you get 500 of your counts to be zero and the other 500 to be one. Of course, with a finite sampling, you don't get exactly 500. If you got a thousand shots, you'd get somewhere in the region. And as the shots go to infinity, you would get convergence to the actual theoretical probabilities determined by the amplitudes of your quantum state. Um, so effectively, we'll just go and run this quantum circuit and you can read this information in the notebook uh, once you have it. But to execute the, the, the circuit, we, we say we create this job object and this job object is effectively created by calling the execute function with the quantum circuit as the first parameter, the backend, which we specified as a chasm simulator, and for the shots, we use 1,024. Um, you can use any number of, uh, of shots. I think there's, there's a reasonable um, a limit on the simulators. I think it's something like uh, 100,000 or something like that. Um, but effectively, we always try to use the same amount of shots that are available to you on the real device. And the limit on that is, I think, 8,192. Uh, but for the demonstration of this um, you know, tutorial, we just use 1,024. Um, from the job object, we can get the result and we can use the get counts function to actually get the counts of how many times we obtained one or zero uh, of all our, in all the shots of our experiment. And because we applied X to the state zero, we expect that every time we measure our qubit after applying this gate, we get back the state one, 100% of the time. And that's what this counts here actually indicates to us. It says that after measuring the, the identical 1,024 copies of the experiment that we created at the quantum circuit, uh, we got back the state one, which is exactly what we expect. Um, and I, I, I explained this in, in, in words here as well. So an example now would be, you know, let's construct a simple quantum circuit that places the qubit in a state that, you know, roughly when you measure it, it gives you the result zero half the time and one for the other half. And we can do this using the Hadamard gate. So we initialize our registers and circuit as we did above. And instead of applying X now to the qubit, we apply H, which is your Hadamard gate. And we put the same barrier in the same measurement. And we follow the same procedure for executing the circuit with the chasm simulator. And we plot the counts and we see here, we expect that we should get zero about 512 times and one 512 times. Um, but instead, as I said, with finite sampling, you're not gonna get exactly 512, 512 but we see we get zero about five, 506 times and we get one about 518 times, which is approximately half and half. So I think that's just, you know, if we consider finite sampling, that's a good enough approximation. Now we can, we can plot the results using the visualization tools built into Quizkit. Uh, and we, we import from the visualization tools, this function called plot histogram, which will effectively just plot a histogram from the counts that we obtained here. So if we put the counts in here, we get a histogram telling you effectively uh, how many times you got zero and how many times you got one. Um, now, there's other types of simulators that you can use that are built into Qiskit. Um, the other simulator, so far we've only considered the chasm simulator, which replicates uh, what it would be like to run your circuit on a real device. Although there's also the state vector simulator. Now, the state vector simulator effectively just you start out with a, with a set of uh, register of qubits, you apply your operations, and it will give you as an output, the state vector that corresponds to the, the, the quantum circuit uh, that you've just ran. So if you know linear algebra and you know a bit about quantum computing from the other lecture, you'd know that the outcome of the circuit is a state vector, um, which is constructed by applying your unitary, uh, your unitary gates to the 
um, your initial register of qubits. So this is simple linear algebra. Um, so the state vector simulator is going to take your quantum circuit object that you've constructed, and instead of outputting uh, a dictionary of counts, it'll output rather an array, which effectively is the state vector that corresponds to uh, the output of the circuit. So for single qubits, we know that an arbitrary single qubit state can be written in this way here, in terms of zero and one, because the single qubit is of course a two level system. Um, and these coefficients here are called the amplitudes. Um, this effectively gives us, you can express this as a column vector where uh, you just put A at the top and B at the bottom. This obviously tells you that the basis, uh, the computational basis vector zero and one will just be zero will just correspond to a column vector, which is just one zero and one will just be uh, zero one. Um, it, we should note that this A and B are complex numbers. And by the Born rule, these amplitudes here are related to probabilities by the absolute value squared. So we say that the absolute value squared of A is just the probability of measuring our qubit in the state zero. And of course, absolute value squared of B is the probability of measuring the qubit in the state one. Since the qubit is a, a normalized vector, um, which we have the condition that the absolute value squared of A plus B uh, plus absolute value squared of B is one. Um, so that just maintains that the, the length of this vector psi is always going to be one. Um, to use the state vector simulator, we don't need a classical register because we're not measuring and storing information in classical bits. So we just construct a quantum register and then we have a quantum circuit, uh, but with no classical register. So we only put one qubit in here. Now, the following circuit that we're going to, to execute is going to create the state that's called minus. This is an eigenvector of the uh, poly matrix X. And we're going to see how the circuit that we have here will reproduce this uh, state vector here. So, to our quantum circuit, we first apply X and then we apply H, the Hadamard gate. This will construct the state minus. If we draw it, this is what the circuit looks like. And now instead of using chasm simulator from air, we actually change the back end so that it's the state vector simulator. Now the job, when we execute it, we don't actually need to specify shots because we're not, we're not doing it like the real device. We just specify the quantum circuit and then we specify the back end and we get the result object from this job object. And instead of getting the counts, we use a function called get state vector, and we feed it the quantum circuit, and we also give it the number of decimals that we want our state vector to. We can print the vector here, and as you can see, you get the state vector, and you can see it matches the minus uh, uh, get vector that we had above here. Of course, we can use something like SumPy, to actually print this uh, a bit more reader friendly. And we can use the SymPy pretty print function. And this is what it'll print it out as. So we can read this a bit better. And of course, all this tells us is that we can, the probability of measuring the qubit in the state zero is half and one is also half. Um, yeah, so that's basically this using QuizKit for simple single qubit circuits with the two different types of simulators. And I think now we can go on to something a bit more visual and talk about using QuizKit to actually represent a single qubit on the block sphere. So you might have learned with, with Prof, or you know, if you haven't, I'll just tell it to you here that the single qubit state has a very useful visual representation. Unlike other uh, states of qubits, uh, we can't really visualize uh, two qubits on some sort of plot. But for a single qubit, it has a very, very nice visual representation on a three-dimensional unit sphere that we call the block sphere. Of course, you know, the origins of this representation uh, is, is, is based in, um, in, in group theory and we can actually relate it by the adjoint representation of SU2, but you know, that's not important for, for this uh, STEM talk. So we'll just go through how they relate uh, via this general parameterization of the single qubit state. So for the single qubit state that we defined before, we know it belongs, it's a, it's a two dimensional complex vector. And we can in general express it because it's also normalized. We can in general express it with this parameterization in terms of two parameters, theta and phi. Um, we, we should also note that there's a global phase that you can also add in this general parameterization, but global phases aren't measured in quantum computing uh, and also in quantum mechanics. So we usually omit them when we write out our states of our quantum systems. Um, of course, we can write this 
uh, psi as a column vector like this. And we also have the, uh, the bounds on the angles theta and phi. So uh, theta usually determines the probability to measure, um, to measure this, uh, in the state zero and one. And phi will describe something called the relative phase, which you can visualize when you see, when you see how we represent our qubit on this block sphere. So to represent our qubit, the state of our qubit visually on a three-dimensional unit sphere, the reason it's a unit is because our state is normalized. So the, when we draw um, our, our, our block vector, we plot, sorry, the block sphere, we know that every, um, every point on this unit sphere corresponds to a quantum state um, uh, of, of, of the single qubit. Um, of course, I should, I should mention pure state. Um, inside the sphere, if you make it a ball, then you get these other things called mixed states, but I'm not going to be talking about them here. So every state psi of the qubit has a corresponding block vector R, which is a three-dimensional real vector. And this block vector R can be written in terms of the, the parameters theta and phi in usual spherical polar coordinates, or the, the components of this block vector can be obtained by uh, measuring the observables uh, sigma x, sigma y, sigma z, so the Pauli matrices. By taking the expectation values of these Pauli matrices, we can ob obtain the components of this block vector. So the block vector will always start from the origin and touch the surface of the unit sphere. And it will be a vector that represents the state of our single qubit. So, you know, I just should mention how do you take the expectation values of observables in quantum mechanics. And an observable is just a Hermitian operator that corresponds to some observable quantity that we can measure from our physical system. Uh, by Hermitian, we mean that it's equivalent to its complex conjugate transpose. To take the expectation value, usually what you'll do is you will have your system in some state, say psi, and you'll sandwich your, your Hermitian operator in between these two states. Um, if we use this density matrix that we define here, which is the outer product of our state psi psi, we can also write this expectation value as the trace of your observable times rho. We obtain this, uh, uh, this trace uh, um, formula here by just making use of the properties of the trace and of um, these outer products of these bra and ket vectors. So the block vector in general is written as R and the components, as I said, are the expectation values of the Pauli matrices. How can we plot this block vector using Cascade? Well, we need to import the plot block vector visualization tool and we just import NumPy. So let's try to plot out the state just zero. So the state zero will correspond to in our parameterization uh, an, an angle where theta is effectively just going to be zero because cosine of zero over two is just cosine of zero, which is one. So we can plot the block vector with QuizKit and we can just specify to QuizKit that the, the vector that we're going to give it or this array or list that we're going to give it is going to be just a radius, theta, and then the phi. And we just tell QuizKit that the coordinate type is spherical. So R is always going to be one. Um, and that's because, as I said, the state is normalized. So we're only considering vectors that touch the surface of the unit sphere. Um, so when we plot the block vector, the first parameter is going to be um, just R, uh, is going to be a list with R, theta, and phi theta and phi about zero, and we specify one spherical coordinates. And we get this very, very nice plot, which shows us that the state zero aligns to the positive z axis on the block sphere. And of course, when we want to plot one, we'll see that it should align with the negative z axis. So the plot block vector function can also use Cartesian coordinates. So if we have our vector, our block vector in terms of the expectation values of x, y, and z, sigma x, sigma x, and uh, sigma x, sigma y, and sigma z, then the block vector can just be plotted by specifying the, the coordinate type as Cartesian. So here we have that the um, expectation value of zero with respect to all of the Pauli matrices is just going to be zero, zero, and one, only when we take the expectation value of zero um, with, 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 of, of z with respect to the state zero. And we, we plot it with Cartesian coordinates and we get the same block vector here. So what about if I wanted to plot the state plus, where plus is just going to be roughly, you know, one over square root two, it's gonna be a state where you're roughly half the time in zero and half the time in one. 
Well, a state like this has parameters theta being pi over two and phi being zero. Using Qiskit, we feed these parameters into plot block vector function, and we see that this plus state actually points along the positive x-axis. And if we do it with Cartesian coordinates, this is what the, um, the vector would look like. Um, it's, the same, it's the same block vector. So something we should mention is that the minus states that I showed you in the previous uh, uh, notebook actually points along the negative x-axis on the block sphere. So now let's just talk about the single qubit gates and how they transform the state of your qubit and plotting those block vectors on the qubit, uh, plotting those states of those qubits on the block vector, on the block sphere, sorry. Um, we import just the standard, you know, your quantum circuit, classical register, quantum register, and your, um, your simulators. You need air so you can call in your simulators. And we also call the execute function. Um, here I've just suppressed some warnings uh, which casts complex numbers into real numbers. This is because of truncation error in calculations. But in general, expectation values for observables should always be real numbers. They should never have any complex components because um, of you know, the fact that they're Hermitian operators, so their eigenvalues are real and observable quantities can't be complex because we're meant to observe them. Um, we write a function which extracts the block vector given the state vector of that corresponds to the state of our qubit after we apply our, our gates. So what it does is it first constructs that density matrix rho, which is the outer product of our state vectors. And we define our poly matrices and we get x, y, and z as just that trace over x, sigma x times rho, sigma y times rho, sigma z times rho. This is just the components of the block vector. And this function here, extract block vector, will just return the, um, uh, the list which, is the compo which are the components of the block vector. So let's just look at the action of the X gate on, the, on, on a qubit in the state zero. So it's the same circuit as before. Uh, just now we don't run it with the chasm simulator. We're gonna run it with the state vector simulator. And you've seen how to do that already. And when we get back the state vector, we just store it in a variable called state vector. And we can plot the block vector in Cartesian coordinates by calling the extract block vector function and giving it as an input the state vector. And as you can see, we know that X applied to zero is one and it points along the negative Z axis here. So we say that the X gate induces some pi rotation around X. So if we start out in zero here, then a pi rotation will be uh, like this around X. There's the X axis there. Um, what about, what is the Y gate? So the, the poly matrix sigma Y, what does that do to the state plus? Well, we, we do the same procedure now, except our gates in our circuit will just be first H so that we can construct the plus state and then Y applied to the plus state, as you can see here. We do the same procedure by running this with the state vector simulator and we plot the block vector and we see that it, it, the, the Y gate applied to the plus state gives you the state that's called the minus state, which is um, which points along the negative X axis. And we say that the Y gate induces a pi rotation around Y. And what that means is it goes pi, so 180 degrees around Y. So like down there and points there. So we're starting out in plus, which is along positive X. We can also see what the Z gate does to the qubit in the plus state. And it's the same procedure. We just change Y to Z in the previous uh, cells. And we also get it here along the negative X axis. But now we know that the Z gate induces a pi rotation around Z. So whereas before we, we went downwards here under the sphere and went back up here, now we, we want to rotate around Z. So we have a pi rotation around Z. So we go from here, we rotate along this line that my mouse is pointing to, and we point along the negative X axis. Um, we can also you know, show that using the state vector simulators that uh, Z can be expressed equivalently by HXH. So we can decompose Z into the Hadamard gate, the X gate, and another Hadamard gate. And this is what it looks like here. And we show that when you apply these to the plus states, you get the same outcome. So if instead of using Z on plus, we just use HXH on plus. So that's what we've constructed in the circuit here. And when we run this the circuit, we get the state vector, we feed it into the extract block vector. Uh, we plot it and we see we get the same, um, the same state, that, the block vector that points along the negative x-axis. Um, 
And we just also repeat it to show that H and Z point uh, uh, plus Z on plus also points in the same direction. So that's basically just some um, interesting ideas we can uh, realize with, with Qiskit and just understand how this, the single qubit can be visualized on this block sphere. Uh, and something I should mention um, as I close is the power of quantum computing is really seen when we look at this very simple case of the block sphere. Um, when we think of classical computers, we use a single classical bit can only be in the state either zero or one, right? And I, when I mean state, I'm referring to it can only take on the value zero or one. But a quantum bit, although when we measure it, um, we, 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 we get the outcome zero or one, we can store a lot more information in a quantum bit. That's because every possible state of a single qubit because of superposition corresponds to a point on this unit sphere. And of course, we know from simple mathematics that there are infinitely many points on the, this unit sphere here. So there are infinitely many possible single qubit quantum states. That just shows you how much you can actually, uh, information you can store in a qubit. And there's a very famous uh, um, uh, a little thought experiment one can do and rather some math, a little proof where you can actually count the number of possible states you can store on a single qubit. And you can look into a standard text such as um, the quantum computing book by Nielsen and Chuang uh, to, to look into how they count how many possible um, states you can have on the block sphere. Um, but yeah, so that's just how powerful the single qubit is. And there are many algorithms that you basically just use a single qubit to do. Um, and one could look into that by looking into some standard papers that you can find online. But that's basically all I wanna say about the, with this introduction to Qiskit. Uh, if there are any questions, feel free to ask them now. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Ian. Uh, so questions? You can type in the help channel on Slack, or you can use the chat. Um... On Zoom. So I saw a hand up. So if you raised your hand, can you please ask your question on the help channel? Uh, Namakuku, can you please ask your question in the help um, channel on Slack? Okay, uh, I hope the questions are coming. Ah, what are the current limitations to the implementation of quantum computers at a large scale? Okay, that's a complicated question, but let me see how best I can summarize this for you because this is, this is the big open problem in quantum computing right now. Um, effectively, this term was, was coined by, by um, researchers in the field and the term is uh, noisy intermediate scale quantum device. And this means that all the algorithms and all of the nice theory that was developed since the 80s uh, till the advent of the first ever NMR quantum computer in about 98, 99 uh, was designed for the fault tolerance setting. And by that, I mean uh, a quantum computing and a, a computation that can be done with quantum computers that has error correction. So um, all of the, the algorithms, they, we, they assume you know, access to uh, quantum resources such as uh, you know, n number of qubits and, and you can apply gates as, as many of them as you want and you can make measurements and they're all clean measurements. And we assume that we found a way to completely isolate our qubits from the external environment. But sadly, that's not how things work in, in the real world and right now. Um, that's why we have this term noisy intermediate scale quantum device. And what this refers to is that usually the quantum devices that we're able to build now, and I remember IBM uh, had a, had a, a, a superconducting qubit based architecture out in 2017 that was available through the cloud. And one of the major problems is being able to actually isolate your, your, your qubits from the rest of the environment. And by that, I mean, uh, when you talk about things like open quantum systems, which is my area of research, um, we talk about a quantum system that's interacting with its external environment, exchanging energy uh, and information uh, with, with its environment. So for example, you know, very simple example would be if you took a glass of ice water and you left it in the middle of a, a, room, a, a, a room at room temperature, 25 degrees Celsius, the water will, the water will gain the energy from 
the uh, the outside and it'll you know rise to room temperature. It's the same thing with quantum systems, although they're much more sensitive. So you know, small perturbations in temperature can add noise to your computation. And doing something that is uh, as precise as a computation requires a lot of accuracy and a lot of precision. Um, Peter Shaw famously in 1996 developed uh, the theory of quantum error correction, uh, which was meant to mitigate the effects of this noise. But to actually uh, implement quantum error correction, you need a bottom, uh, efficiently, you probably need millions of qubits to do that. Right now, I think IBM has 433 qubits in a machine, but there are so many limitations, such as the fact that the qubits interact with each other and that they interact with the surrounding environment. And this adds noise to the system. Um, we have other you know, major limitations, such as implementing you know, uh, gates cleanly, all your quantum gates. You need a way to implement these. Uh, these are implemented as electromagnetic, uh, uh, you know, uh, electromagnetic um, pulses. Uh, that transform the state of these qubits, these, these superconducting qubits. And we need ways to implement these cleanly. There's also limitations with regards to the number of entangling gates that you can do. And these are called uh, controlled knot gates that you can do between qubits. I mean, usually the more interesting stuff in quantum computing comes when you have quantum algorithms that make use of multiple qubits and when you include entanglement into these systems. Uh, but doing these cleanly and doing these uh, for many, many, many C knots is a, is a tough problem. So companies such as IBM and, and, and Rigetti, et cetera, have coined terms like quantum volume, which tells you how many gates you can implement. And right now that quantum volume isn't very, very high. So we can't do very many interesting things. Um, but that, in saying that, you know, it sounds all doom and gloom, but um, this you know, has also pushed researchers to develop algorithms for the NISC setting. So uh, instead of just trying to implement our algorithms developed for the fault tolerance setting in this NISC setting and getting poor results, researchers, especially in, in fields such as quantum chemistry and quantum machine learning, even in quantum simulation, have developed means and methods to actually go about implementing these, uh, solving these problems that these algorithms in the fault tolerance setting solve, but mitigating noise and error in the NISC device. And, uh, people have been able, in, in terms of quantum machine learning, people have been able to uh, actually do classification problems, uh, as well as even run simple neural networks on quantum computers uh, in the NISC setting. Um, they've even been able to do quantum chemistry in the NISC setting. So um, while the limitations are vast, I think uh, people looking into NISC algorithms right now uh, is what's actually driving the interest in this in this field. Um, because we're sort of tailoring algorithms to suit the NISC setting rather than just developing, uh, you just trying to implement fault tolerant algorithms. That being said, we also still develop algorithms for the fault tolerant setting. But it is the hope that you know companies get better and better at building quantum computers because it's effectively an engineering problem, uh, and we get better and better at isolating these these quantum systems from the environment and being able to implement these uh, gates cleanly. Um, and you can look into the companies such as Google, Microsoft, IBM that are investing in different types of quantum computing architectures and, 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 uh, and devices and, and new techniques to build devices that can overcome these, uh, these problems that we face with these near-term devices that we, are, that we have available to us right now. So I hope that answers your, your question. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Ian. Uh, Nomakugu, I hope your question uh, was answered. Uh, I will take uh, two more questions if uh, any of you still have questions for Ian. I see there's an, another one. Um, will quantum oh, yes. computers <laughs> pose any threat to current uh, security protocols? Okay, um, so in the current state, no, quantum computers will not pose any threat to, to current uh, encryption protocols. But with Shaw's algorithm, uh, yes, it would be very easy to break RSA encryption. Uh, of course, getting to the point where we can sufficiently execute Shaw's algorithm, then we're a long way away from that. So I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be too stressed about somebody using a quantum computer to hack your, <laughs> your encryption. Um, and I see there's one more here. Um, okay, I think even though single qubits are interesting, but individually they offer no computational advantage. And that multiple qubits and entanglement is in most of the researches. I am interested in quantum encryption research, 
and so far it is still limited by by progressing. How would you advise advice uh, going forward with this? So I think it's it's um, it's not fair to say single qubits offer no quantum advantage, um, and so no computational advantage. As I've mentioned, you can store a lot more information in a single qubit. So um, yes, I agree that you know you need entanglement to do uh, the interesting stuff. But um, sometimes people can use a single qubit to actually store um, to store information, um, uh, a lot more information than you would. And I, I think I recently in the archive, I saw a paper on a multi-class swap test classifier um, that effectively uses a single qubit to store all the label states of the classes um, uh, that, that they used to do multi-class uh, classification. And this significantly reduces the system size of previous multi-class classification algorithms. So single qubit is very interesting. Um, and I understand that the, the progress in quantum encryption and in, in QKD is, is very slow. And I think uh, that's because I would say that uh, on the theoretical side, there, there have been many encryption protocols that have been de developed I think um, the famous one, and I think I, I, the one that I know, and this is because I've, I've met the gentleman who developed it, the, the E, I think it's E91, the, the one that's developed by Arthur Eckert. And I think a lot of it is going into implementing uh, these, these, encrypt, these QKD uh, quantum cryptography protocols. And there are governments like in China, for example, that are looking to do, in looking into doing satellite QKD and the quantum internet. And I see all these articles all the time. So my advice to you would be to, to look into these uh, encryption schemes and, and maybe speak to somebody. I, I personally, I, I don't work in, in quantum cryptography, but um, I, I know of, uh, I know of um, an academic at UKZN, uh, Dr. Yazir Ismail, who works in specifically this field. Maybe you can speak to somebody working in the field. Um, I think that, that would be my advice to get in touch with other researchers working in the field of, of quantum encryption and quantum cryptography and, and just look into the types of, of, of research that has been done, not on the large engineering scale, like what governments such as China are doing, but how you can improve uh, algorithms, et cetera, for doing quantum encryption. Um, that would be my, my advice to you. Uh, as I, I mentioned before, my field, I research theoretical physics and open systems and quantum simulation, but maybe get in touch with somebody uh, who does quantum cryptography and they can better advise you on, on um, a way forward. Uh, okay, so I think, um, I think those that was two questions, and I think that should be uh, done. Okay, uh, perfect. Uh, thank you again, Ian, and thank you, uh, Hope and Nomakugu, for the questions. And I'm not sure if you provided your contact details, just in case people have more questions in the future or. Ah uh, yes. Uh, then they can just uh, send you an email. May, uh, yeah. Okay. Maybe I can. Can I post it in the chat? Or ah, uh, you okay? It's it's can fine. You, I will send it in the help channel because I yeah, I have it. On I'll send them. Okay. Yeah. 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 All okay. right. Uh, thank Thank you so okay. much. Thank you, Dr. Killer. Okay. Thanks again, Ian, and thank you, uh, 